establishing time on something without revealing the content. Um, you may have seen hash functions used for digital signatures because digital signatures are a public key operation. They're slow. And so you can't give them gigantic inputs because they'd be really slow. So we always hash down the input and then sign the digest, right? It's called the hash then sign paradigm. And if you've taken a crypto class, you've seen this to death already. There are lots and lots of more applications of these hash functions. These are a couple. All right. So the problem is, is that if you were to just take a function, a random function from 0, 01 star to 0, 01k, it's not going to have a compact description. It's going to really be an infinite length table. But we can't do that. It's not practical. We have to come up with something that has, can be compactly described by an algorithm. You have to be able to write down in C something that's no more than 2 to the 20, 2 to the 30, 2 to the 40 bits in length. 2 to the 40 would already be an extremely long program. Um, so we can only look at programs that have a nice compact description, or they won't be simple, fast to compute, and portable. And this limits us to somewhat. But they shouldn't be something too simple, like just take the last 128 bits of the input and output that. That's not a good hash function. Something that should feel random. Um, once again, this is a very fuzzy concept. What does it mean to feel random? So this is the way almost every hash function that we use is built. We build them out of a compression function. Okay, So a compression function is another hash function, but it doesn't take all length strings. It takes very specific inputs. Uh, the compression function listed here is called f, and it takes two inputs, an n-bit input and a k-bit input, and it outputs k-bits. So it compresses n plus k-bits down to k-bits. Okay? And these things are designed by hand by the hash function designer. So you've got a compression function. Now you need an initial value, and here, uh, and it's going to be k-bits. So this is an arbitrary um, k-bit initial value called the IV for initial value. And this one's a palindrome. Um, it is the IV used in MD5, in fact. So it's 128 bits, the one I've listed here. And then finally, once you have the initial value, and you have the compression function, you then iterate it using Mar merkle damgor And merkle damgor works like this. So here, here's our, our friend f again, the compression function. Uh, as you can see, it takes n and k bits on the input, smashes them down, and k bits comes out. The iv is on the left of the picture. And then this value that comes out of the compression is function is called the chaining value, because we then chain that into the next k-bit input for the next compression. So that's how merkle damgor works. You just uh, break the message you want to hash, the input you want to hash, into n-bit chunks. You stick the IV in the first chunk into the first compression function, out comes the chaining value, and you just keep doing that. The next chunk of n-bits goes into the compression function with the chaining value, and you get a new chaining value, and you iterate this until the end, until you've absorbed all of the message bits of m, and the last chaining value becomes the hash digest for that message. Any questions at all? You seen this before? About five people are nodding. OK. The cool thing about using the merkle damgor paradigm is that all you have to do is prove that the, co that the compression function is collision resistant. Sometimes this proof means a lot of smart people try and they can't find a collision. but. If you can convince yourself that the compression function f is collision resistant, that you can't find collisions in any reasonable way, then you automatically get the entire iterated compression function. Uh, an iterated hash function is collision resistant. So this is nice because it allows you to focus just on building good compression functions instead of looking at the entire iterated hash function, which can be a lot more work, a lot harder to get your mind around. This is the first um, hash function. It was called Rabin's Hash after Michael Rabin, who's a Turing Award winner. He did this way, way back. It's 30 years ago now. And he <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> used a block cipher that you've probably studied before called DES. And his approach was to just take the message blocks as 56-bit chunks and feed them into the key input of DES. The chaining value was the block input and the block output for DES. So you can build a, a, um, a hash function out of a block cipher. Now, this isn't actually used because for inversion resistance, where we have an output and we're trying to find an input, there are meet-in-the-middle attacks. Um, 
using some feed forwards and so forth, other wires, you can make this much stronger. And in fact, there are lots and lots of ways to make hash functions out of block ciphers. But we won't, that's not the topic of the, of the talk today. Okay, so the strength of the hash function is based on the strength of the compression function. So you have to build good compression functions. If you build them by hand and you have good confidence that they're collision resistant, you automatically get that the iterated hash will be collision resistant as well. Um, all of the hash function attacks that have occurred over the last several decades have always focused on that compression function because it's also true that if you break the compression function, you'll break the iterated hash. So while it's a good place to invest your ingenuity when designing compression functions, it's also a good place to invest your ingenuity when attacking them. And people have broken um, MD4, a guy named Hans Dobertin, who just passed away actually two months ago, um, broke MD4 back in 1996. And here, when I say break, I mean found collisions. There's other properties we're not going to talk about today. It's all about collision finding. Okay, so he found a collision in the MD4 compression function and then was able to find collisions in the overall hash function. Um, MD5 is um, an improvement on MD4. So MD4 had three rounds. MD5 has four rounds. We'll see a little bit more about MD5 in a minute. But it was well. It was known and thought felt by Rivest that he needed to uh, increase the strength of MD4, so he created MD5. The whole family of MD functions produces 128-bit outputs, 128-bit digests. Um, MD5 is the only one to survive the 1990s. There were some attacks we'll see in a minute, but uh, no collisions had been found through the 90s. And because it had lasted for so long, it was still quite widely used and is still quite li widely used because we have legacy applications which use it. And as you all know, as software people, you can't just change an algorithm overnight and expect the world to adopt it, right? There's, there's, there, there, there are widespread uh, deployment issues that you have to worry about and update issues and so forth. So MD5 is still quite widely used. MD4 is still quite widely used, too. Um, have, who in here has used rsync before? Okay, a couple people. So that uses MD4 still. And MD4, you can find collisions by hand now. Okay. So the first attacks on MD5 came in the 90s. Um, De Boer and Valsler's found a free start collision on the compression function of MD5. By free start, I mean that it, they found a message and a chaining value, and then a different message and a different chaining value, such that the outputs from the hash function, from the compression function, collided. Now this does not give you a compression, uh, this does not give you a collision in the overall iterated hash because you've got a mismatch on the chaining value, and you need the chaining value to be the same. A few years later, Hans Dobertin found a collision for a, fixed, for a fixed IV, a fixed chaining value. So here, CV is the same as CV. Message blocks are different, as they must be, and there's a collision. However, the chaining value he used, which although it was fixed, was not the MD5 IV. So once again, he had collisions for a different IV other than the one specified by MD5. Getting close to a collision, but no success yet. At that point, Dobertin went dark on us, and he wouldn't publish any more stuff. He worked for the German equivalent of the NSA, and people think maybe someone put some pressure on him to stop publishing his results. Um, it may be that he had collisions in the full MD5, but nobody had any more results after this on MD5 for many, many years. But already people were getting worried enough to start migrating away from it at this time. Okay. Enter... February 2004, um, I, was on, I was on the Crypto Program Committee. Crypto is the biggest, one of the biggest conferences in all of computer security or in cryptography. And the Program Committee receives papers and evaluates them and so forth. And we received this, uh, this submission from uh, a woman named Zhaoyun Wang from Shandong University in China. Nobody had ever heard of her before, at least on the PC. And she had co-authors too, but she was the first author. And the paper purported to have found a collision in MD5, which would be the hugest result for years in cryptography. Um, how, unfortunately, we passed this paper around. It was almost illegible. It had been faxed in. It looked like it had first been copied onto crate paper, then crumpled up, then flattened, and then faxed in. You couldn't read the 